Muje baleko, basebo ne banyabo. Let's talk about Harriet. Like many other small business owners, Harriet saw the transformative power of the internet, and she wanted to be a part of it. But without a smartphone, she couldn't. For you and me, a smartphone is a relatively commoditized tool. It's so ubiquitous, it's so common that it's actually kind of annoying. But for Harriet, a smartphone is the first way that she will be able to access the internet. Once Harriet acquired a smartphone, she could enhance her sales through social media marketing, she could capture photos of her work, and she could, and as you saw, feel more connected and more content. Harriet is not alone in benefiting from smartphone access. A recent study of small businesses in Africa revealed that owning a smartphone can increase sales by up to six times. The digitization of businesses is not limited to wealthier economies. It's happening right here in Africa. And this is a trend that has been accelerated by the COVID-19 lockdowns. Why then do so few people in Africa have a smartphone? The primary challenge is affordability. The average smartphone here costs around $125. For someone like Harriet, this could be one of the most expensive purchases of her life. Hundreds of thousands of smartphones are bought and sold in Uganda every month. But over 80% are bought by people who already have a smartphone. In other words, trading is happening, but penetration has plateaued. Let's do some math. Most people in sub-Saharan Africa earn less than $5.50 a day. If you're at this income level, and if you saved 10% of your total income and put it towards getting a smartphone, it would still take you over half a year to be able to afford that smartphone. And in reality, over that period, you'll have unexpected income shocks and unexpected expenses that will push back that dream of owning a smartphone, too often indefinitely. Feature phones are common in Africa. Smartphones are not, and that's a problem because without it, millions of people are not able to access the internet. They cannot compare prices online. They cannot harness social media marketing. They cannot use those agricultural apps. And they cannot benefit from the digital economy that you and I consider home. But accessing the internet is not just about making money. I spent COVID in Uganda. We hold the unenviable record for the longest continuous shutdown of schools in the world. For two years, students were forced to learn from home. During this time, what was the primary method used to educate children? Radio. That's a technology invented well over a hundred years ago. I remember sitting at my family's dinner table watching my sister-in-law solving math problems. Her teacher had set up a WhatsApp group to share homework. It wasn't great, but at least there was some interactivity. My sister-in-law could learn. But she was the exception, not the rule. And she was the exception because she had a smartphone. At the time, 82% of students in Uganda had no access to the internet. No smartphones, no internet, radio. I use the example of a smartphone because it helps us understand the challenges faced by people like Harriet. We can all imagine not having one. It highlights how people like Harriet are excluded, not just from the internet, but from the wider financial sector as well. If owning a smartphone can skyrocket business revenues, why don't people like Harriet just take a loan to get one? Well, fewer than a third of businesses in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to a bank loan or credit. The sad reality is that the options for financing are extremely limited for individuals with lower incomes. To secure a loan without credit history, you're often required to provide collateral equivalent to the value of the loan that you're seeking. You also have to pay for securitization, administrative, and insurance fees that can drain your resources. As if that wasn't enough, interest rates in Africa are higher, tend to be higher, compared to the rest of the world. Studies have shown that even after controlling for risk ratings 
and macroeconomic factors, African countries are burdened with interest rates nearly three percentage points higher than non-African countries. This creates an unfavorable banking environment for people like Harriet. So, most turn to informal markets. They rely on family and friends, loan sharks, or smaller, scaling, smaller scale saving and loans initiatives. But these alternatives all come with their own sets of challenges that put somebody like Harriet at a disadvantage. It is expensive to be poor. That's where M. Copa comes in. My name is Juan de Francisco Rashid, and I manage the Uganda entity of M. Copa. We're a fintech company. Our headquarters are in Kenya, but we also have operations in Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. At M. Copa, we provide credit to customers often excluded from the traditional financial market. Specifically, we offer non-securitized asset-backed loans. This means we provide loans to help customers access technology, like a smartphone. Unlike traditional lenders, we do not require credit history, nor do we take collateral from our customers. Instead, they pay a small down payment to get immediate access to the smartphone. Over time, they pay off their loan using digital micropayments. As our customers make these payments, they start building a credit history. And this credit history enables them to unlock more capital and a range of products, including direct cash loans and health insurance. The best part is, because we now know the customer, we can offer these products, these services, at more affordable rates than other companies. MCOPA provides a way for customers like Harriet to step onto the financial and technological ladder. We empower them to access the tools they need to improve their lives. As we developed our lending model, we found something interesting. Most consumers in Africa had sporadic daily incomes. But most financing programs required customers to pay back in months. This created a gap, and the pressure was on the customers to bridge it, not the companies. That's why at MCOPA, our payment plans are almost always payable in daily increments to match the way our customers earn. $12 a month, that's expensive. But $40 cents a day, that I can afford, especially if I'm making $1 to $2 in incremental daily revenues. We're proud of this new form of ethical lending. It is inclusive, it is flexible, and it is transparent. In our innovative approach, the device itself becomes a crucial tool for credit management. If a customer fails to pay, our Internet of Things technology remotely locks the device. Unlocking it is as simple as just making a payment. This flexibility allows customers to choose the days when they can afford to pay and use the product. They can skip days when cash is tight. And if a customer is not fully satisfied with our financing model, they can return the device, receive a full refund of the deposit, and cancel their outstanding loan <coughs> obligation. Very few credit providers in our markets offer such risk-free opportunities for customers to walk away at any point in their loan. This customer-centric approach has been instrumental in our success. It has propelled us to become one of the fastest growing fintech companies worldwide. Building the model has not been easy. It took us eight years to reach our first millionth customer. Now we are acquiring that many customers in months, not years. Since our establishment in 2010, we've unlocked $1 billion in capital and dispersed it directly to low-income, underbanked, and underserved customers like Harriet. Our journey is far from over. To continue expanding our impact, we recently secured $250 million in debt and equity, making it one of the largest raises in the African tech sector. I've spent several years in here in what has been one of the most humbling periods of my life. But if I could pick just one lesson 
from what I've learned from this experience is this. We must treat low-income customers, low-income people as customers, never as beneficiaries. It's not just about semantics. When you treat someone as a beneficiary, you create a mental model where they should be happy with anything you give them. That's not the right mindset. When you treat someone like a customer, you recognize that they deserve the same quality of products, services, and opportunities as everyone else. Thank you. <laughs>